the people who adopt the capabilities approach don't really regard it as a way of, you know, explaining why some countries do better than others at improving well-being. It's, it's more of a way of uh, sort of conceptualizing and evaluating well-being. And it's, mm -hmm. it's often contrasted to two other types of approaches, one focused on resources mm -hmm. and one focused on preferences or the satisfaction of preferences or, to put it more simply, happiness. Mm -hmm. So these are all different ideas of what you want to maximize, say, in the life of a poor person mm -hmm. to improve everybody's well-being. So one hypothesis, you improve their freedom. Mm -hmm. That's the capabilities approach. And Sen is in no, associated with this approach, right? Is Absolutely. I think the book you assigned, isn't it called Development as Freedom? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not Development Causes Freedom right. or Development is Caused by Freedom. Right. It's Development as Freedom. So there's a, uh, you know, it's a logical relation as much as a mm -hmm. conceptual, there's sort of an intrinsic connection there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a resource-based approach would basically say that, uh, you know, the goal of, of development is to uh, make sure that everybody has a minimal amount of, like, food, clothing, shelter, and so on. That was, like, the basic needs approach from the 1980s. From the capabilities approach, that's really inadequate mm -hmm. because the problem is that even if you have these resources, people differ quite a bit in their ability to translate those resources into well-being. And, for example, a, a person with a certain type of disability might have a much harder time translating, uh, you, you know, um, uh, an adequate amount of, of food, say, into an adequate amount of nourishment. Or right. like a, uh, you know, a, a person who had his you know, a chronic disease might not be able to utilize the food in the proper way. So, yeah. you know, if you're focusing on development, uh, I think the thing to focus on is people's capabilities. And what sort of capabilities? Freedom, freedom to choose. Mm -hmm. Not just freedom to choose haphazardly, but freedom to choose thoughtfully, reasoned choice, what, reasoned choice. what Aristotle called practical reason. That's mm -hmm. the thing you want to maximize. Another uh, approach is that you know what you really want to maximize is people's ability to satisfy the preferences that they already hold, mm -hmm. or for example, to make themselves happier. Mm -hmm. But from a uh, capabilities perspective, you know, um, happiness is greatly overrated. <laughs> you know, before about 1600 or so, we were all here to love and serve God, not to make ourselves happy, and the whole idea of being happy is actually a fairly recent invention. And, uh, you know, if you think of it, I guess there's the old saying that, uh, you know, uh, Socrates dissatisfied is better than a pig satisfied. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, the idea there is that, um, as Karl Marx once said in his economic and philosophical manuscripts, Suffering, humanly considered, is an enjoyment of the self for man. Mm -hmm. So in other words, that even emotions that we would consider to make us unhappy, like you know, grief, sorrow, uh, uh, guilt, mm -hmm. uh, these are human, truly human emotions. So mm -hmm. from the capabilities approach, what you want to do is maximize the extent to which people can lead uh, a fully human, uh, in other words, a thoughtfully chosen life, which is not necessarily a happy life. And, and yeah. Because yeah. when they say happiness, they really mean satisfied. Yeah. They mean like that, that you get your preferences satisfied and not I mean, not happiness in the in the classical sense, which had something ready to do with reason. Like you right. you, know, you weren't really happy if you sat around uh, like a pig all day right. stuffing your face or exactly. playing video games. Yeah. You were satisfied or you you were not moved to do other things, but that didn't count as real happiness. Um, it sounds like this notion of happiness has a lot to do with education. In other words, it's reasoned and purposefulness. And so that having the opportunity to reflect on your own choices and to be aware of choices that you might not have, or preferences that you didn't know you had, right? So edu is education a, a significant element in this capabilities framework? Yeah, absolutely. Education is a route to freedom mm -hmm. uh, in all all kinds of, of different ways. So education is is very important. 
education doesn't necessarily make you happier, but it definitely... You're telling me. After all <laughs> so, these years of school, I'm still not happier. <laughs> well, it definitely makes you... It enriches your life, and yeah. it's then that it, you know, it, it shows you that, uh, you know, the, the purpose of life is not merely to play video games yeah. and eat a lot of good food. So, uh, but, you know, let's, let's face it, like, among the capabilities, some are more important sure. than others. Right. And the capability to survive physically is, is quite fundamental because, Absolutely. you know, to, li to live the life we have reason to choose, we have to be alive. That's right. And in order to be educated, you need a certain level of health. Exactly. Right? You, you know, to, to be able to think and, and reflect. Yeah, there's all kinds of research out there that shows that feeding little kids uh, a decent breakfast, you know, greatly improves their school performance. So it, it, when you weave education and the capabilities approach more generally into thinking about a health and, 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 and the kind of global uh, health challenges we have, it, it makes it seem like it's a, it becomes an even more daunting task, more expensive mm -hmm. task. But I know in the book you argue that's not necessarily the case, that, that it, it's not always, the, the, there are expensive solutions, but they're not necessarily the, the, the best ones. Sure, that, that's absolutely the case. And on the education front, if you take as the outcome that you're interested in the reduction of premature mortality or say the reduction of infant or child mortality, mm -hmm. uh, statistically it's, fairly easy to show both at the household level, at the cross-national level, that female education is much more important than male education. Mm -hmm. Both help to reduce premature mortality, mm -hmm. but uh, educating girls is much more important than educating boys. So that's actually, unfortunately, the opposite of the situation in many developing countries where the girls have a much larger educational deficit right. than, the, than the boys do. Right. Although, as you know, in the United States, the, the opposite is true, and it's the boys who are more educationally challenged than the girls. But providing people with a basic education, as Ivan Illich pointed out long ago, hmm. does not require a cyclotron. Right. So uh, it just requ requires you know, some good teachers and uh, paper and pencil and yeah. a few books and, and you're, you're, you're and time, ready, ready to right? go. Yeah. yeah, time, Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that's one of the things that really improves health a lot that is cheap. But if you look at, you know, uh, some things that improve health are extremely cheap. Health education costs virtually nothing. Right. Um, child immunization is very inexpensive. Things like providing nutritional supplements or oral rehydration therapy for children with diarrhea, mm -hmm. that's very cheap. Other stuff that's very helpful is a little more expensive. Things like providing safe water, adequate sanitation, family planning services, uh, certain types of education is a little more expensive. But uh, you know, even the, the total amount, if you add up the total amount of money that all of these interventions mm -hmm. cost, and compare it to the total amount of money spent on, that governments spend on things in many developing countries like topping off middle class pensions, right. providing university educations, subsidizing gasoline for people's automobiles. Right. If you put those together, those are all vastly more expensive than the sum total of the other interventions. But, uh, you know, the government's... Uh, do these a lot more than they do the other interventions. So right. the, the trick is to get, you know, the, the money to move from the regressive policies to the progressive ones. Now, I mean, cynically uh, asking this question, is that because the person who wants cheap gasoline votes um, and the child who dies doesn't vote? In other words, um, you know, the, or the, even the very poor whose children are dying they're less likely to play a role in politics than the person who wants to drive and get subsidized gas or subsidized crops. Or, I mean, is there a, is does democracy in in some uh, cynical sense undermine this uh, effort at global health? Well, there, uh, the relation between democracy, thought of as free and fair elections, mm -hmm. basic human and civil rights, and effective authority to the people who get elected mm -hmm. has a complex relation to other outcomes that we value, because 
democracy certainly has intrinsic value as well right. as instrumental value, but you know it has a vexed relation to outcomes like rapid economic growth mm -hmm. or low infant mortality. It's not always a congenial relation, hmm. and um, you know, for example, um, if you survey people like in the United States, you find that. Uh, they often prefer curative health services to preventive health right. services. So if politicians do what majorities want, they're going to be enacting policies that are sort of inimical to people's health. Right. In other countries, I mean, I looked at some surveys from places like Indonesia and Thailand right. back in the early 70s. People were much more interested, at least the survey respondents, were much more interested in income generation than they were in uh, health facilities. Right. That may have been inimical to their health, so if you know, governments are doing what majorities prefer, mm -hmm. you know, they will do things that are uh, not conducive to public health. But if you look cross-nationally, there is a fairly robust and positive relation between more democracy and better health. In this course, we're, we're looking at some real extremes. So last week we talked about uh, extreme poverty and some of the things uh, different groups are doing to combat extreme poverty. Uh, and you know, this week uh, there's some focus in, in my remarks on some of the most dramatic health uh, challenges we have from, from diarrheal diseases to uh, HIV AIDS to uh, especially the diseases that cause um, high infant mortality mm -hmm. um, and uh, or, or radically premature de death. And I wondered if, you know, from your experience cross-nationally, looking at different kinds of political regimes and different geographic areas, are there a couple of things that stood out for you that um, uh, are um, sophisticated but not necessarily ultra-expensive ways to, to deal with these extreme health issues? Well, I think, uh, I mean, one example that really sticks out in my mind is from our own country. Mm -hmm. In my book, Wealth, Health, and Democracy in East Asia and Latin America, I looked at four countries, four in Latin America and four in East Asia. Mm -hmm. But I grew up in the United States, and the United States is always on my mind. What lessons can the United States learn from yeah. places like, you know, Chile mm -hmm. or South Korea? And uh, I remember reading an article uh, in the New York Times that I later investigate a little more closely about Sharkey County, Mississippi. Uh -huh. It's in the Mississippi Delta. And uh, in Mississippi uh, in general, from 1980 to, was it? No, 1990 to 2005, mm -hmm. uh, the infant mortality rate for non whites actually went up. It went up from about 15 per thousand to about 17 per thousand. Mm. This is the infant mortality rate for non-whites in Mississippi, which is the poorest state in the United States. 17 per thousand is a pretty high infant mortality rate. For example, the infant mortality rate in 2012 in Brazil, according to the World Bank, is 13 per thousand considerably lower than the infant mortality rate for non-whites in Mississippi in 2005. But there was one county in Mississippi, Sharkey County, in the Mississippi Delta, where one inspired physician uh, collaborated with a place called the Cary Christian Center, which subsisted exclusively on private donations. and. This physician, in conjunction with three members of the Cary Christian Center, who were, you know, elderly yeah. women for the most part, uh -huh. uh, developed a scheme whereby they would find out everybody in the county who was pregnant and then go visit them once a month, bring them in a bus to have uh, classes, prenatal yep. classes for expectant mothers, postnatal classes for new mothers, and from 1990 to 2005, while the infant mortality rate for Mississippi as a whole went up from 15 to 17 per thousand, the infant mortality rate in Sharkey County fell from at least 15 per thousand, I don't know what it was in 1990, to five per thousand. Wow. So that's less than 
one third of the rate in the uh -huh. state as a whole, even though Sharkey County is much poorer than in the state as a whole. Huh. And this intervention costs basically nothing. The ladies working with the physician, uh, they didn't have any medical training whatsoever. It was all a matter of finding out where the people who need help are, doing some very inexpensive interventions to yeah. help them, and just just organizing things. Organizing and education, right? I mean, yeah. those were uh, fascinating. Well, that really leads me to the last question I have is, you know, the. Uh, the name of this course is How to Change the World, and, and uh, you know, many of us, the students uh, watching our videos and re doing the reading are eager to, to get involved with organizations or do something that will not eradicate extreme poverty or get rid of uh, these, these uh, uh, terrible diseases, but would make some positive difference in that regard, like your example just now. And yeah. I wonder if you have um, other thoughts for our students about the ways in which they can get more involved to make a positive difference around issues of, uh, of health and disease. Well, one thing people can do is that if they live in a country which is not democratic or even not optimally mm -hmm. democratic would be to you know, try to establish, consolidate, or deepen democracy in some way or another. So you know, from the capabilities perspective, you know, development uh, is freedom, yes. but uh, to some extent I think freedom does cause development you know, thought of as, in part, uh, being able to lead, lead a long and healthy life. Right. So I think democracy is one route that everybody has the capacity to, uh, you know, to, to uh, enhance. And apart from that, people should do whatever uh, they personally are trained to do. Yeah. I'm, I'm a college professor. I'm a political scientist. So what I do is to try to analyze why some countries enact good health policies and other countries don't, right. and then extract lessons for institution building and political pressure and policy design, which is consistent with that understanding. But many other people you know, who are not political right. science professors, they can train themselves to be frontline health providers, mm -hmm. doctors, nurses, radiologists, lay health personnel, mm -hmm. um, they can, uh, you know, go into uh, the biomedical field mm -hmm. or engineering, they can start businesses that create medical devices or pharmaceuticals that can help people. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have money, you can give money to good causes like yeah. partners with Par partners, partners in health, health yeah. or Doctors Without Borders, other wonderful institutions like that who are helping to make people healthier in uh, the poorest countries uh, of the world. Um, but yeah, in general, I think that uh, uh, the one thing that everybody can do is to uh, you know, make, try to make their politicians more responsive. Raise of, awareness and, 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 and uh, educate ourselves. Yeah, one of my favorite lines from Development is Freedom is from the chapter on democracy where Amartya Sen writes, you know, democracy does not operate on human development like quinine works on malaria. Yeah. I mean, you've got, it's, it's up to, it's up to, you know, democracy only creates opportunities. It's up to citizens and politicians to take advantage right. of the opportunities that democracy creates. So I think it's up to all of us to use the freedoms that democracy permits, if we're fortunate enough to live in a democratic country, uh, to push our politicians to enact policies that will uh, you know, improve the, the well-being of the less fortunate members of our societies. Yeah. Well, I think uh, classes like this uh, that raise awareness about those conditions and about interventions that uh, can be helpful in that regard, uh, I, I, I hope is a step in that direction for the listeners and, and, and for us as teachers, I mean, uh, as, we, as we work with students here at Wesleyan and, and now around the globe. Yes, I think that's uh, you know absolutely uh, a lot of a lot of things start uh, with education, and I guess you know education in a sense is freedom uh, as well. Oh, that's something I very much believe. And thanks so much for talking with me today. Thank you.